Okay. Are we good? Okay. Baruch atah Adonai Eleinu Eleinu Melech HaOlam Hashem Otan HaTorah. Amen. Right. So, we decided to leave the fun of judges and kick into some New Testament epistles. Um, so, framing this obviously is going to be part of the fun. What I thought I would do is instead of stopping and giving you images, I am going to give you the imagery for your reference sheet. And every time you read something, you'll be able to pick it up and you'll be able just to go remember I said that. Okay? So, at that way we, will, we won't have to stop the flow of the letter, we will get the gist of what the letter is about. Okay? So, as we start off with every epistle, what are your rules for epistles? Right. Okay, what's the first thing when you open up a book? Find out where the place is. Right? Find out timeline. Okay? Timeline is going to help you sort of figure out what's going on. Okay? Because if it will be a vastly different thing if we say, let's just be silly, Ephesians was written in the time of... Um, just before the resurrection. I've said I'm being silly. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> 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 Impossible. Correct, that is right. But and then that would frame us, we would be asking questions like, where's Yeshua, what's going on, is he the resurrection, um, is he the first fruits, how does this apply, etc, etc, right? So if we nail down our timeline and then we can put it in its culture, then we can go into things. Alright, okay? So, basic timeline. Uh, oh wait, one more thing that you need to remember. With every epistle, you have half the conversation. Okay? With every epistle, you have half the conversation. Just stop and think about that for a second. That's trying to figure out what your beloved or someone else is sitting there listening to their end of the conversation on the telephone and concluding what the whole conversation was about. Easy, yes? Right. This is the problem. When we look at these epistles and we have to unpack them and we have to pull them out, pull them apart, we need to understand. We are now listening in on a conversation and we might have answers or we might have advice or we might see a theme and our job is to identify the theme so that we can pick up from the advice what the problem might have been. Okay? Once we understand sort of both sides of the argument or the point of the epistle, then we can frame it, put it into its culture and context and then draw out from that aspect. Once I draw out from that aspect, I can go through the epistle with my pictures and I can understand what he's all about. Complicated? Jolly good. This is unfortunately the problem that we don't do this. We don't take the time. We don't understand the language, the history, the people, and why they were writing anything. We pick out chapters and verses and we create theology. Okay? This is a letter. A letter is one of the most expensive things you can do in antiquity, ancient time. Why? Not just describe. It has to be transported. Right. So, I want to send a letter to Israel. I have to send Aubrey. Aubrey gets a pay of one denarius a day. But I have to pay for his ship thing. I have to cover his food costs. I have to cover his accommodation. I have to make sure he gets back home and on top of that, if he's just a nice guy, that's all I have to pay. This is not the post office or courier or whatever, just put on a bus or an airplane and then it arrives in three days later. This is a handheld thing that goes across and gets delivered to the people and understand there's only greetings, there's only structure. We don't really see much of that over here, but you've got this guy, pictures up there, you go, hi, you don't know me, but Paul sent me. I have a letter. 
or we will hang on sick. And then they can stand up and they can read this out in front of the entire congregation and it's as if Paul has given this person the authority, you can trust him, it's fine, this is for you, wake up and smell coffee, these are the things we want to address. Because they were living there, they understood what the problem was. Okay? So, big challenge. So, before we get into the epistle, you need to go sort of timeline. Okay, so this will probably be around his third week, and we expect the third missionary, after the third missionary trip. Um, remember, he was Paul after going on the first one, the second one, the third one. He popped in in Ephesians, is mentioned in Acts 19. Um, but Paul went through, remember, he was arrested in Jerusalem because they accused him of having a, bringing a Gentile into the temple. Big scum. Yes. Didn't happen, right? Okay. So they took him, they beat him, and then there was a massive fervor. The crowd was so big that the Romans came out and they thought, right. So they grabbed him and they were like, what's your problem? Slip him up the steps, put him down. And then he says, look, I need to talk to the people. He addresses them. They shout at him. They go, well, you're just causing nonsense. We'll lock you up. He says he's a Roman citizen um, in one of his many beatings that he got. Um, and then he sort of just appears before different people. They take out a plot to kill him, if you remember. They said, we will not eat until this man is, is killed. And they find out about it, and they ship him off to Caesarea. Now Caesarea was basically the governor's town, cosmopolitan city. Very, um, very wrong. When you go to Caesarea, first one of the first things you see of, of the little that they have uncovered is a 4,000 seat theater. You walk from there to a into a basically into one of Herod's palaces. You walk past the public toilet. Um, you walk into a hippodrome. The hippodrome is basically like a big gladiator, gladiator arena for horses. Horse racing was the epitome of declaring who Caesar was. Who is God? Who is Caesar? And then one same thing. You find mansions at the back and we would imagine later if they did excavations it's in a they need to pay lots of money to do it but you would probably find over bath houses and so on and such forth i'm going to use illustrations that um i'll give you a, a road map of a place that we visit in um, not only caesarea but when we go to israel we also visit another roman city called Petrian. Petrian is ancient Scythopolis. it is the decapolis's capital you guys all still with me? Okay. Big pagan city, biggest pagan city capital. It's built in Roman architecture with Roman buildings and it gives you a Roman layout. Okay? Every Roman city was built the same way. So that when you walked into the Roman city, you wouldn't have to ask where the theater was. You wouldn't have to ask where the bathhouses were. If you came down the Cardo Maximus, the main road, Shops on your left always the bathhouse, on your right always the theater. Okay? You would carry on and then there would have niche markets and then there would be a road crossing, Cardo Minimus. Come up and you would go up to the blacksmith houses and the things on the top right hand side. Shops all along the way. In the center of the Cardo Maximus you would find an altar to the goddess of the city. In Betchian's place, Taisha, the goddess of luck. And as you would walk in, you would be continually reminded about how opulent Rome is. Let me just give you an idea. You stand over there and you see rows of columns. Columns from the bottom downstairs, probably till about this high. Right? It's one person's life work to create one column. There are hundreds. Think about it. Hundreds of people's lives to make a city. Okay? As you have this Roman identity, he pulls from Roman pictures, but anyway, in Caesarea, he sits before two different governors, Festus and Felix, and eventually Agrippa II, Herod's, Herod the Great's grandson, and then he appeals to Caesar, and basically what happens is, if you appeal to Caesar, you go to Caesar. Okay? You still with me? 
right? He probably would have been let off on the charges, but he was sitting over there basically just waiting for the time. He didn't like it. Some people believe he appealed to Caesar because God had told him that he was going to go to Rome and he was going to testify in front of Caesar. But anyway, he goes, he appeals to Caesar, and after a journey, a shipwreck, and eventually getting over there, he's basically based near the Tiber River in what we call house arrest. Okay? Now, you are chained to a guy, and his sole job is to make sure that when Caesar says, I will hear his case now, you get him there within a certain period of time. If you don't, you get dead. Okay? So, he wasn't allowed to go out and come back, but he was allowed to have people come in and chat with him. Okay? So, in this time, you would probably have seen um, Luke and Mark's Gospels gone out. Acts probably finished. First, uh, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians done probably about 10 years ago. Um, probably in the third missionary trip, he probably did Romans 1 and 2, Corinthians and Galatians, so that's done. And we probably pegged this at about the time of between 60 and 63 AD, or common era, <coughs> sitting in Rome. He's got people, and there's problems in Ephesus, and he has to write a letter. Okay? Yes? Lots of information, honey. Okay? It's just to give you a timeline that this is nearing the end of Paul's life. Epistles have been written. He's been dealing with the church in, or the region in Galatia. He's been dealing with Thessalonians, which, you know, basically starts about looking forward to prophecy, and then it gets pulled on to, you know, um, Romans and 1 or 2 Corinthians and Galatians deals with what the early churches have to deal with, right? Okay? So, he's sitting there underneath house arrest, and he's waiting to stand before Caesar. I think Nero was in that time. And he's getting reports from Ephesus about what's going on. Alright. We all okay with the history. It's all good. Now, you've got to frame Ephesus. Where was Ephesus? Asia Minor, which is where today? Okay, it's in Turkey. Was it a harbor? Yes. At the time of at the time of Paul, it was a harbor, a harbor city. It was, but it had a problem. What was the problem? Well, it kept on getting silted up. The uh, the cost, you know, the Castle River kept on bringing mass loads of salt, basically. It brings a whole bunch of mud and trees and stuff like that and keeps on building up, building up, building up until it becomes, it starts to push the river a different direction. Okay? So then if you start off with a harbor, right, and then you get a whole bunch of land that starts to grow, you become less of a harbor place because I can't get my ship close enough to be able to offload my stuff. Okay? It was one of the biggest cities in Asia Minor at the time. Um, okay, I'm going to try to describe this to you. When you would have landed, what Paul would have seen is he would have seen something called the Acadian Way with villas standing up in it. This city was completely marble. Still today, the ruins make the ruins in Israel look small. To give you an indication, the biggest theater that we've been in is in Ben Shem, which is 5,000 seats. Okay? It's pretty impressive, right? Ephesus has a 25,000 seat theater. Now, they've taken that and they said, on average, you can multiply by 10 and you will get the population. So the biggest city in the Decapolis would have 50,000 people, where Ephesus would have 250,000 people. Okay? This is why it pops up in Revelation. Okay? It's part of an ancient trade route system. There's temples, there's amphitheaters, there's an Acropolis, which is an upper city called Acro Ephesus, and there was a temple to Diana, otherwise known as Artemis. Okay? Now, what do we know about Artemis? Yeah, it was. 
Artemis was the goddess, uh, the goddess of war, and the Dino was goddess of war. Okay. And uh, so the beautiful images. And sex. Well, there's a, there's a few different things, okay? She, when you look at Artemis, and remember the Romans got their gods from the Greeks, so they basically amalgamated a few ideas and myths and things like that. So Artemis became known as Diana, and Diana actually started out as a, um, she was the goddess of the hunt. So she was always depicted with the bow and arrow in the woods with a little deer or something like that. And then later started coming in, that's, sorry, that's Diana, and then Artemis was the goddess of love and childbirth. And then it sort of got a mingle post in between where Diana now is the goddess of the hunt, she's the goddess of childbirth, she's the goddess of the moon, and the goddess of the underworld. Okay. Some, in cases when they've done the study, they give her the name, let me look at this one. They call her the Triformis. Three gods, but it's actually one god. Sound familiar? Interesting, they very, very similar idea. But she's also the goddess of love, and one of the most interesting depictions of Artemis, when you look at her statues, was what? How many of you looked at the statues? She, had, she looked like she had animals as clothing, and then lots of other, yeah. Artemis, yeah. So sometimes she was also depicted as sort of like a but looking after little animals and the rest of the time she has got a head with rows and rows and rows and rows and rows of breasts. Yeah. You can take you to the Israel Museum. They have a bust of her and you sit over there and you think, okay, fine. Childbirth. Right? So you think this, she's nurturing, she's love, she's a mother. And I will remind you of a title that God gave himself as El Shaddai. A shut in Hebrew is a breast. So, what God was saying as function was that I am your every need, I can nurture you, I lift you up, I can give you whatever you need. And the counterfeit comes later as also. Isn't God love? Love one another, love your neighbor, and by and is love. It's interesting to me that here yeah, we've got this idea of childbirth. You know, specifically she's, she was depicted as a virgin. Now we've got a few other little myths that came in later that said she threw that away and she went off to some other deity. But she was a virgin person who was in charge of helping other people bring into child labor. So I don't know if that's sort of a, an illusion to a counterfeit of the virgin birth, um, not as strongly, but there is definitely some sort of link there, okay? She was served by unique priests, called the Kyros priests. Her temple had 220 columns in, so 220 people's lives, right? In the center, or the near chorus of it was, uh, Ephesus was the center of Artemis worship. Okay, so two things. Temple in that time would issue out loans. So you came over there, you wanted some money, we would lend it, you would pay it back. Less Artemis, everything's great. So they would get money coming in, but they would also, it was the center of selling off all the little Artemis bodies and things like that. And people would come back from all over the world to come to, to Ephesus to be able to get one of those little little house of idols, okay? One of the images that you're gonna pick up on, do you guys remember what happened, I think it's in Acts 19, right? Paul, was it Paul? Yeah. Paul was, no, they were spreading the gospel. Open up your Bible. Right? Yeah. right? And they start talking about this God not being the real God, and Yeshua being God, and Elohim being God, and something happened. Why was there a big, what, what, what happened after that? Yes, 
Yeah, sort of like a robot. So it's not riding a baby one because they said they can lose a lot of money because they can't sell the items. Right. Okay. You see that in action? Yeah. Okay. He gets everybody grumpy and he says, that's it, and they want to take off these guys. I don't think they've got on a pole, if I remember correctly. And they ship him off and they put them into the theater. And they start shouting. 25,000 angry people start declaring what? What are they shouting? Great is awesomeness. Great is Right? Carrying on. They shouted for two hours. 25,000 have got you on stage. And all they're doing, listen to this. It's a very interesting thing. Um, there was something called the Artemis procession, okay, which later sort of gets adopted by the Romans in a, uh, the Romans in a way. In this procession, there was the priests, then the lesser priests, then people with uh, torches. Um, they were declaring who protected the city. They went into the theater and they proclaimed Artemis. when they were being challenged by their God, and you need to understand why there was such a massive reaction, was that because the harbor was salting and the Romans decided there's no point in actually trying to keep this thing clean, it's impossible, right? Ephesus started to fall into decline. The only thing they had left was Artemis worship. That was the only thing keeping the city alive. When they get challenged, they fall straight into what they understood and they got everybody together and they formed part of the Artemis procession and they sat in chanting for two hours declaring who was God. Do you sort of see that Joshua sort of play here? Remember Acts parallels Joshua, right? Every time you look in Joshua, they took on physical battles, but it was the spiritual battle behind it that was really taking place. Our God versus your God. Acts comes in. It's more spiritual than physical. Who's he challenging? Challenging your God. Can they stand before our God? And they fall straight back into the idea of pagan worship. There was a very interesting find very interesting things in Ephesus. In Ephesus you find little etchings in the streets, um, etchings in the games, or they've got games etched into the streets and then they've got footprints carved into the model. And you would follow the footprints until you find the lady. And the lady would stand there with her foot up and it would be painted. And then you would follow the footprints as it walked away from you. And she would take you to temple. Okay? Temple prostitution. I found something very interesting as well. Um, in the library, there was seen to be an underground tunnel connecting the library and the brothel. I'm just going to study my life. I'll be here about two hours. Okay? Some people believe it was some sort of drainage. Other people believe it's way too big for that. Okay? Later became adopted by Domitian. Domitian Caesar. He demanded his own worship. He wanted to be called Lord and God even by his wife. And Ephesus was one of its biggest pushes. They built a temple to the mission in Ephesus. There was two gyms, art houses, um, that basically parallel, uh, paralleled the Zeus complex on Mount Olympus. Um, so they were going full out. So this is a really good place for a couple of good Jewish boys to go and visit, right? This is where we find a Messianic synagogue. Now you guys don't think you're worried yet. Mm -hmm. Right? The temple to Domitian was, was something else. We discussed this a little bit in Revelations. What you did there was he built out a platform. And on his platform, to get the platform, he built arches. And on his arches, he had arches. Okay? And on these, there were little depictions of different gods. And on top of all the gods was... Domitian's temple. Okay? They, you know, he basically put all the other gods beneath him, and his statue was 27 foot in size. Okay? 
So a picture of that, yeah, just a little bit of four, four of me standing together on top of one another, right? Okay? He brought out the Domitiu processions. He had altars in the streets then uh, with titles to declare that he was God. It happened once a year. At the base of the arches he had a fountain with every ancient city you need living water. And in this fountain was a declaration for the mission. Why would he put that there? Absolutely, right. So if you look to your gods, right? Here's my fountain. Right? You want water. You come up and you go, oh, it's Domitian's water. How do I know it's Domitian's water? Because it's at the bottom of Domitian's hill. Right? But who holds Domitian up? Every other God. But no one stands above Domitian. Paul is a Roman citizen. He comes from this. Roman culture. Roman identity. You cannot go into a Roman city without declaring or offering to anything. You want to sell in the marketplace, you need to give an offering to the God of the marketplace or to the God of the city. You can't go into the bathhouse without giving to the God Hygiene. You don't want to become, let them become angry and destroy the city, do you? In a region plagued with lots of stone columns and earthquakes. When you go to Bechiyan, they found the, the city was abandoned. You go over there, you see columns that the archaeologists left. Massive things. It's, it's jungles. They stand over here. You can't. I, I look over a column that's lying on its side. That was from a big earthquake. They left it there to give you an idea of the devastation of things that happened. The rest of the stuff they try to put, put, back, uh, put back up. This is the Ephesus we are dealing with. Okay, you guys with me? Yes. Alright? So as we are dealing with Ephesus, you should have in your mind something that's extremely, the crown jewel of Asia Minor, something that is declaring to Artemis, declaring to Diana, but now declaring to Domitian. Something very Roman, something very important to Rome. Alright? And the point of this epistle, according to your research, is what? Bring them back into life. Or divorce to the mind. No, it's funny. Paul uses imagery from Roman lifestyle to bring, to teach people who understood. There's a divide. There's them and there's us. What do you know about Roman lifestyle? Individualistic. Very individualistic. What else? Status oriented. Right? If you were part of a dirt poor society, that means you could not fall afloat, literally. That's why you were dirt poor. Right? You understood that you were not allowed to talk to an equestrian. An equestrian had status. They had, and again, according to your status, so we would go like the basic person, the citizen, the equestrian, the senator, and then to the guys like Caesar. According to your rank, you could talk to or be spoken to. According to your rank, you had rights. If you weren't a Roman citizen, we can beat you and kill you and we have no problem. But if I beat you and you're a Roman citizen, and I don't give you a fair trial, then I'm in trouble. So when Paul was flogged and he said, you treat Roman citizens like this, they were like, oh, hang on a second. Is it true? Because if Caesar found out, the problems would be on his head. Every citizen is entitled to a free trial. Every citizen has the right to appeal to Caesar. We belong to Rome. How foreign are you feeling away from any Bible study you've had here so far? Jewish culture, Jewish mindset, biblical understanding, paleo Hebrew, and now all of a sudden you never heard. understand what he's dealing with. Okay? So let's look at the imagery. Some of the imagery that you're going to pick up in here is... Yeah. It's, it's, it's really about 
how do I bring people in from a Gentile persuasion into a Jewish inheritance, into a kingdom of heaven, into a Jewish God? We have the Jewish Messiah, we have the Jewish covenants, and I'm using that term loosely, right? The covenants of Israel, the covenants of Abraham, the Isaac, the Yaakov. We have Moshe, we have Joshua, we have a land, we have Torah, we have Mashiach, we have the Ruach HaKodesh. You're a Roman. Ach, shame. But I really like the idea of your God. My God's nuts. Which one? All of them. Tell me about this Mashiach. Tell me about this Yeshua. Okay. You come over there and we sit there. You're sitting in a synagogue. The synagogue's on the outskirts of town. We're in the dirt poor section. We convert people's houses. Sound familiar? They cut holes into people's walls. Was made here in our God. And we put our Torah scroll in there. And we meet as a family and we get together and we discuss. And we struggle culturally. We struggle because we can't sell our stuff out in the open like that. We struggle because we make a stand. If you wear six seats, you stand up in there and I, I cannot be a part of that. We don't fit in anywhere. We are them. From Ron's perspective. Flip it. We, them, Romans, are to come into our kingdom now. And it was mind-boggling to try and understand how that was going to work. You're not Jewish. I don't understand why you even want to. Where's the identity? How are we going to do that? And Paul hears about this division in church between the them and the us. Remember Galatians has gone out. One of the things in Galatians, it confuses a lot of people, but it has the same theme, is there is neither slave nor free, Jew or Gentile or man or woman. It doesn't mean that when you got big fat in the water, all the other stuff fell off. I came out, I'm still a man. Right? It just means that he sees no difference. There's no Jew and Gentile in God's kingdom. You either belong to him or you don't. It's always been that way, but you guys have failed to see that. You've missed the point. Right? He's got a covenant people with the seed of Jacob, but Israel is ultimately the people that will stand. God's Israel is those who belong to Israel, belong to Him. So, I've spoken to you guys about this before. How do I make, or He, he sees this process, right? Remember, He's on that life chain arrest with a guy who was probably not Roman by birth. Alright? As they expanded kingdoms, you cannot, as you expand your borders, you need more people to guard your borders, yes? You lose people in war, no matter how good you are. So now we have to build up and bolster our ranks. So what they would do is they would capture people, and they would bring them in, and they would civilize them. The word servitas is Latin for city, and it brings them in to bring them part, to make them Rome-like, in a sense. Okay? So the, the idea for us civilizing someone is literally to make them Roman. Okay? So when I go into this idea of making someone who's now sitting there change to this Jewish rabbi named Shogu busy writing letters and probably terrorizing him to death about this Jewish Messiah that's brought everybody into the kingdom. Awesome ministry, right? You're in the light chain. You can't show him up even if you want to. Okay? You're sitting over there and you're dealing with this and you would have to, this non-Roman who became a Roman had to go through a process. Now Rome at that time was going through, there was some serious tension, increasing tension. Taxes were rising, they increased region, and uh, just to give you some context, just before Yeshua was born, Rome turned into a professionally paid home. Most of the taxes that went in weren't only to look after Caesar, but were actually to keep Rome's army available, ready, and in check. Okay? Now, I need to take this guy who we've captured from, let's say, let's use our example. Rome comes here, that's what they do. Get over here, pull in, and we find some from both others from Painsville. Okay. And he comes in, and he needs to understand, he's understood farming. He's understood the way he runs his house, and he's understood very South African culture. He understands books, sisters, and drivers. Now I have to teach him about 
senators, equestrians, and both houses. Right. Jolly good. This is going to be fun. No, it's not. Oscar no Does it work? Right. So now we stop working for the day. All right. All right. So part of this process, number one, okay, was to first of all stop. Um, I'm going to say stop all activities. All right. So anything you used to do that's not acceptable to Rome, you get rid of. Okay. Second thing, yeah. You find your place in society. So you were the furthest bird in of our spontaneous hope, and now you are nothing. Okay? You will sit when you get talked to, and you will stand when you get talked to, and that's it. This one will give you rent. Okay? And with that, there's this other side process which will promise you a piece of land which is yours for retirement once you get out of your army duties. Okay. Once this process here will be dealt with what they call the adoption process. Now, when we start looking at the adoption process, first of all, you will hear words like, you have been chosen. Now, what does it mean to be an adopted in a Roman society? Uh, you actually have more rank than a, than a born Roman in society because you've been chosen, you weren't just like, that's what you did. Right. So, remember, Caesar Augustus became the next Caesar because he was the adopted son of Jesus. Tiberius became the next Caesar because he was the adopted son of Caesar Augustus. Right? You can't choose your family, but I can choose my boy. You get a chosen successor. Okay? So for us, it's kind of like, well, let's bring them into the family. But for them, it was like, you're the next. You're the heir. I'm grooming you. Okay? So with this adoption process, you are chosen. Then you are, let's call it, brought in. Now, some of this, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of interesting. Some of these guys obviously were, were, were bought in slave trade. Okay? So, when you were born in slave trade, oh, sorry, you had, you were sold, there you are, completely in your buffs with a little necklace and a tag. And that tag is called a tishlag. Now this, this tishlag is basically your guarantee. Your name and on the back of it, what you do. Okay? The main focus is on, he can speak English in Afrikaans, he's a boulder, he's a farmer, etc. And he can brag. Right? Stuck on his chest. Now that's my guarantee. If I want someone who can bribe, I'm going to take him. If I want someone who can fight, I'm going to look for someone who is a captain in the guard. If I want someone to do sacred duty, I'm going to look for someone like that. If I want someone to go and trade for me, I'm going to look for someone who can speak more than one language. You get it? Okay? So as you were brought in, okay? as you were brought in, you were adopted, you were chosen, when you were chosen, you were given a name, okay? And depending on how many names you had, then the more important the title, all right? So you would start off with, yeah, let's forget your name, let's use Josephus, all right? Everybody know Josephus? Josephus was a Jewish historian, he was a general in the army, and he flipped sides because he knew that we couldn't take on Rome, and then he said, the best way to serve my people was to write about So they brought him. What's Josephus' Josephus' surname? Flavius. Flavius. Nice Jewish surname, yes? No. Flavius, he came from the 
Flavian clan. Yeah, Flavio was, okay? He came from the clan of Flavian. And because you come from that clan, you get promised piece of land. They will give you a little token when you were adopted and you got your name and you went through all of your process. That will say, your plot is plot 47B. That's your guarantee. That's your inheritance. You will keep that on you until the time of your retirement. What they didn't tell everybody was they gave a whole bunch of people 47B. Because they didn't think you guys were going to survive. Right? So, you get a promised piece of inheritance. Okay? Um, interesting picture. This piece, or this seal, or that was sealed, is what you'll see Paul will talk about as the Ruach of the Dead. Okay? Once you get completely brought in and you get your pledge of inheritance, which is your seal, you would go through your citizenship class. After you get taught about how to act, remember, Romans made hierarchy in everything. According to where you sat in theater, in your Colosseum, in any position of what buildings you were allowed to in and were, or were allowed into and not into. That made no sense, right? Mm -hmm. What you were allowed to go into and not. Mm -hmm. that thing. You, everything declared on your status, everything declared on your name, everything declared on your title. The big box in the Colosseum, when you go to Caesarea, that's the king's seat. He gets more space there. Why? Because it's his, right? After they go through all of this and they survive, you would basically take a pledge of allegiance and call it a statement of power. You are now Roman, you will act Roman, you will live Roman, and you will forget everything that you were before that point. With me? Okay. Now, we've got some very interesting images, right? That where we're you gonna you're gonna deal with. Okay. I don't know if I should do that. I feel like I'm losing it. You sure you wanna get into this? Okay. Alright. So we've already started talking about the triumphal procession. Okay? So this procession of coming in on that the mission would would would, would uh, bring in we see this you know, we quickly go to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14 for me. So make a description of it. Read for me 2, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Good answer. Uh, uh, yeah, no, Nick will read it for us. But thanks be to God, who in the Messiah constantly leads us in a triumphal procession and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of what it means to know Him. Okay, right? It's a small piece, but it's a Roman idea. Alright, we'll see this in Ephesians. No, no, that's fine. Okay? Okay. For to God we are the aroma of the Messiah, both among those being saved and among those being lost. To the latter we are the smell of death, leading only to more death. But to the former we are the sweet smell of life, leading to more life. Okay. Right. Why that is so pertinent? Listen to Paul. Okay? There's this procession. When Caesar comes in from, a cap from conquering an army somewhere, right? He comes in, they would paint his cheeks red, or the conquering general, they would have red cheeks. He would come in. If you're looking for a marking, you can mark this down. It's in Ephesians 4, verse 1. You don't need to read it. I'm just giving you the imagery this week, okay? He comes in, he says, he basically led the captivity, the, the, yeah, the captivity captive. He brings the people in. As they come into the city, as they come, come from, from conquering the people outside, the first people in the procession is the Senate. The second group are the trumpeteers. So first are the senators, then the trumpeteers, 
then they come in with the spoils. So all of the stuff that we get to bring in, remember it's wealth coming into the city. What did they use to fund to build the Colosseum? The stuff they pulled out of the temple. Because the model at the size today that was paid for by the menorah and the altar of incense and those things. Okay? With the spoils would come, they would make little models of the conquered cities, they would bring in a white bull for sacrifice, they would bring in the captives, which were normally executed in the amphitheater. After the captives, they would bring musicians. Then the priests would come with incense. There would be a specific type of perfume. Listen, remember what Paul said, there would be an aroma for death and an aroma for life. The Vincent paraphrase version. To the guys that were being, that were captured, that meant you were going to be, that's what you've done, this is the end of your walk. To Rome, that meant victory. So depending on who you were, depends on what, what that perfume represented for you. Then there, were, there would be a chariot, only four horses, Caesar would probably be in it all dressed in white. There would be a guy holding a wreath above his head while he would be holding, holding the horses. It would be, it's a victor's wreath. Then afterwards it would be the family or the general of Caesar. The army behind him, they would be shouting, Lord to Triumph, victory. And after that, they inside the crowds, as they were going, as the procession was moving forward, there would be dancing ladies that would come up into the, into the crowd and they would throw out what they called spasiones. And spasiones is basically a ticket. Okay? It's a free gift. Right? For them, beer, food. Free gift, it gives to the spirit. Okay? So when Yeshua comes in leading everything that he has taken captive at the end of days, incense was the praise in Revelations, yes? Okay? Right? Taking death and everything into capture, you know, that would be the end of it all. And the people who have been covered with the gifts. Okay? The second image you're going to find again in 4, verses 17 to 28. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 28 is that of a Roman bath system. A bathhouse. Okay? Now, like I said before, you would walk into any cardo maximus, the bathhouse system, would be on your left. Okay? As you go in, you've got a system of hot pools, cold pools, lukewarm pools. You have... You didn't uh, have business meetings in your house, you would have them at the bottom. People generally work till about, they work three or four hours a day, max. Because you only need to make enough bread for today. You don't need more than that, so why are you working yourselves to death? You don't have a fridge, you don't have a place to keep it. Daily bread was a normal thing. You would send them out to go buy what you needed just for today. So you live day by day, okay? And as they would deal with that, that's why you would see these guys that would walk around with tokens and they would have them overlap over the one arm. I'm done working. You, can, you can't work with the two arms. Yeah? So I'm like done. Don't talk to me. But sometimes walking around like that, you would step at a corner some, and you would get some marks. So that needed to be taken care of. Um, sometimes they would have sponsored events. Um, inside of the bar houses, they would normally have a, a gymnos, gym, what does gymnos mean? Meant naked, okay, give you an identification of the clothing structure you would have to use in the bar house. They were none. How many of you, and this is only a man's establishment, do you think being a Jewish man going in there might cause a little bit of a problem? Yes. I can see you're Jewish. I didn't say anything. You didn't have to. Bring me luck and you're away. Funny enough, they actually found apparatus. Shall I mention this? Yes. It's traumatized. They had little clips that you could attach onto the sides of a man's penis and then with little weights and they would actually pull slowly down with the little weights to be able to give you a false force game. Just so that when you went into a gymnasium, where you shouldn't be because you're a good Jew, following Torah, 
they weren't able to see so quickly. Right? So you, you worked on, you went through quite a bit of pain just to be able to blend in to become Roman. Okay? It's a very strange thing. Inside there you would have your bars, you would clean. Um, the frescoes or the pictures in there were being very um, risque. Um, some found in a few places, I will not mention them, so you do not Google. Very um, R18 stuff. Okay, the pictures were very rough. They were sexual in language, trading, they were very vulgar. And that all just brings us to one simple idea. You had toga cleaners. That when you would have a stain over your cloth, to get it out, they would use a wet clean and a dry clean. So what they would do is they would take your very beautiful white toga while you go spend some time in a very unclean place. And they would mix, make a mixture of urine and water. Lots of urine. Something about the ammonia in the urine would release and take the grease or the dirt mark out. They would rinse it thoroughly. That would be your wet cleaning system. Then they would take it to the dry cleaning system where they would make a dome of bricks or a basket thing. They would light a little bit of a, um, yeah, they would burn sulfur. And they would put the cloak over it and it would take up all the impurities. So you would get given a new clean cloak. You will hear him make reference of a new clean garment. That's how they got it that way. Okay? New, pure, and white. Next image. Roman theater. Okay? Chapter 5, verses 1, verse 1 to 8. Different types of plagues in the time of Paul. Okay? There was comedies, and your comedies generally brought up, uh, there was kind of like a twist at the end, a reversal of fortunes, something like the slave was smarter than his master, etc. There was no ladies allowed, and the language was very coarse. There was tragedies, hero died. There were mimes, which were the most popular at the time of Shaw. Uh, which were basically like a uh, talk show, Saturday Night Live, sit over there, act out silly things, do things, very really degrading, lots of sexual humor. And there was a pantomime. Pantomime was basically dancing and acting, all about body control, became very popular. Now he uses something there when he says mimic. Now the word for mimic is mimetite. And that word for mimetai is talking about imitating, right? So the mimes that was most popular in his time, he says, you need to become like, you need to mime God, you have to change it. And it's funny that he uses a Roman image again to be able to get the Romans to understand something. All right? Last image. You guys still here? Yes. Ten. Yes. It's right. Yeah, it's so much of quiet, eh? Last image is chapter 5, verse 8 to 15. Okay? Talks about walking children, uh, walk as children of light. Okay? Um, basically what happened was that Rome started to becoming so full between the people and the merchants that it was impossible for the guys to offload um, and it was always a mess and people were bringing animals off and all the rest of it so they upvoted. They said this can only happen at night. So all of the rough sailor boys and that getting off the ships, bringing on their wares would only come out at night. Problem is, you don't have nice bright street lights to be able to keep everybody in check. What they did was, is they had um, little markers put in place. Kind of looks like a sweetie. Yeah, like one of the sweeties would go. <laughs> okay. And then you would have a station number. So station number five. Okay? So a guy would come up, a guy by the name of, well, they would call it a wigglers. Okay? Um, a night watchman. So he would come up at night, and he would go from station to station to station to station to station with his torture. 
and he's on and he's looking out making sure there's no one getting up to mischief. Problem is, in Roman times, you have pubs, you have taverns, you have brothels, you have people having wonderful times, you have dark alleys, and you have no CSI. Okay? <laughs> if I wanted to get rid of you, a dark corner will do. Okay? So, you as a person, remember you probably would have left the bathhouse, you worked until maybe 12, 1 o'clock, then you would go home, you would have dinner. Dinner lasted three hours long. Three hours sometimes in the lesser Romans, it was frowned upon, but they would go off onto um, some dock, lots of people, clothing, optional, opium induced activities. To get my drift. And other people would go from work, they would go into pubs or taverns. The difference between a pub, a popine, and a taverne is literally the types of food you would get. Okay? Now, maybe it's winter, you're sleeping on dirt floor. You can't afford to make fire in your house because that means wood and you don't have money. Right? So maybe sometimes they would go into the, ta the taverns and the pubs and they would get something to eat and alcohol would flow because it was cheap. It was cheaper than bread. Um, I think in Italy still today, it's cheaper to, it's cheaper to drink than it is to eat certain things. Um, they would go and they would party and they would sing songs and they would have a good time. But the problem is when you woke up and you realized what was going on, the sailors were offloading their stuff. So maybe you had a meeting, maybe a grand late, maybe you had a party. No. You're nervous, you're scared, it's dark, you're alone. What do you do? You wait for the night watchman to come up to the closest station where you are. You would stand there for a while. He would look to make sure everything's going okay. He would shout station five or clear, it's the third watch of the night, or the second watch, or whatever. And then you would attach yourself with him to his light and you would walk very closely to the man with the sword. And when you got closest to your exit, you would run. And you would get in as fast as possible. So that you can come in and take uh, and be safe. Right? That would put the respected people or the people that were very nervous would actually do that. Right? Paul talks about, he says, we walk as children with light, children of light, which is an interesting image. We'll also hear in some of the epistles that he mentions that he says, um, be full with hymns and songs of the Spirit. Because of the pubs and the taverns that they were going through, they would sing songs and it would be a nice atmosphere and go on. And instead of being filled with spirits, funny that an interesting plan, stay away from the alcohol, they would be carrying on with all their stuff and singing all types of crude, fun, dodgy things that is typical Roman. Okay. You all got that? Right. So as soon as we hit certain imagery, you will be able to stop and you will be able to go, that's bathhouse talk. Okay? If he's talking around, singing and going out, he's talking about the pubs and taverns, he's correcting Roman lifestyle and bringing him in into kingdom lifestyle. This epistle is written mainly to Gentiles. Okay? Roman people coming in that have a bit of a culture shock with being Roman is a bad thing. Rome was great. You were civilized, you had the very best of everything, and now you're telling me that the guys that we ruled over, they're actually the ones that have ruled. From a spiritual point of view, yes? Okay. Alright, let's not get into chapter one, shall we? This is not even getting into the room, not even getting into Paul. He's going to be putting some interesting pieces in. Right, guys, just tell me if it gets a bit much, right? Okay. Can we go back to the highest one? <laughs>
<laughs> All right, chapter one. Remember, you block out in your mind, no epistle has chapters and verses. All right, we use them as blocks just to be able to help us get through it easier, but sometimes it'll actually hamper our thought process. So you've got to think of the thing. So, first thing you notice, verse 1, from Shaul, by God's will, an emissary of the Messiah, Yeshua. I thought he was a rabbi from Jerusalem. Emissary. What's an emissary? What do you think of? An ambassador. Uh, shlichim. Uh, shlichim is the same art one, yeah. Right? That's the word we use as an emissary. So he gets sent out as someone who's representing you short. The letter is from him to God's people living in Ephesus, that is, those who are trusting in Messiah Yeshua. Grace to you and shalom from God our Father and to Lord Yeshua the Messiah. That's a nice opening. All right, grace and peace. Don't worry, I'm only going to murder you in a little bit. Praise be to our my Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who in the Messiah has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heaven. In the Messiah He chose us in love, chose us, adoption process, okay? He chose us in love before the creation of the universe to be holy and without defect in His presence. He determined in advance that through Yeshua the Messiah, we would be His sons, in keeping with His pleasure and purpose, so that we would bring Him praise, commensurate with the glory of the grace He gave us through the Beloved One. You have been chosen. Opening statement. Don't let anybody tell you anything. You have been chosen. In union with Him, through the shedding of His blood, we are set free. What does freedom mean to a guy who's on light chain arrest or being held by another guy who has to fight his way to a time? Slavery, hierarchy, where is freedom? What cost set you free? Citizenship was bought with a price. Right? The price here is blood. Our sins are forgiven. This accords with the wealth of the grace He has lavished on us in all His wisdom and insight. He has made known to us His secret plan, which by His own will He designed beforehand in connection with the Messiah and will put into effect when the time is right. His plan to place everything in heaven and on earth under the Messiah's headship. Okay, let's stop there. What secret plan is he talking about? Sounds very covert. Okay, redemption. Oh, I'm talking to Gentiles. Secret plan, I think he talks about it in Ephesians 2 to bring everyone together. Bring the Gentiles in. Yes. Right? Men are us again. And he's already addressing the more you've been chosen through the blood of the Messiah, staying included in him to bring him in the secret plan. It was secret. The Jews don't, they didn't see it. Was it secret in scripture? Can we see it? Absolutely. If they paid attention to the people who left Egypt, the mixed multitude left and they became part of Israel. Why is this a secret? Because their perception of how God was going to redeem His creation was not their focal point. Their focal point was how you were going to save Israel, how you were going to redeem Israel, how we were going to get our land back. What about all the other nations? Well, God will deal with Him in time. The day of the Lord will come. And He's saying, you guys forget that He's the God of creation of everything. He wants them all in. A light to bring the nations in. This is the point, yes? But they only started to realize that after Yeshua started to open up their eyes. Okay? Pointing them back into Torah. Also in union with Him, we have an inheritance. Oh. Right? Adoption process. We who are picked in advance according to the purpose of the one who effects everything in keeping with the decision of His will, 
so that we who earlier had put our hope in Messiah would bring him praise commensurate with his glory. Do you guys have any other translations, any other funny words that are jumping out here? More or less the same? Alright, shout if you do. I know certain translations are, are quite different. Just in the wording. Furthermore, you have heard the message of truth, the good news offering you deliverance and put your trust in Messiah was sealed by him with the promise, promised Ruach HaKodesh. You have your token of your promised inheritance. The fullness of that is going to be established at the end. Right? You're going to see the real freedom. You're going to see the real kingdom. You're going to see the real land that you are going to get. Who guarantees our inheritance until we come into possession of it and thus bring Him praise to next read with His glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your trust in the Lord Yeshua and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. In my prayers, I keep asking the God of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, the glorious Father, to give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Spirit of wisdom? Hora. It's Isaiah 11, isn't it? Right? It's pointing you back to God. Revelation, to open up your eyes. So that you will have full knowledge, also a spirit in Isaiah 11, of Him. I pray that you will give light to the eyes of your hearts. Again, the seven spirits are the picture of the Lord. So that you will understand the hope to which He has called you. What rich glories there are in the inheritance He has promised His people. Let me stop there. Why would He be saying something like that? Why would He be worrying about the rich inheritance that's coming? He's been adopted, remember, he's talking to Romans, right? They've been adopted, they've been given a name change, they've already got a promised inheritance. Why do I need your promised inheritance? Could it be because they were suffering me? Because they were on the edges of society, with seeing everyone having a dang good time, and they don't have anything. If you live, you get inheritance. Daniel Shur says, here's the guarantee you're going to get it with us. Okay? I'm going to set them free as a promised people, right? And how surprisingly great is His power working in us who trust Him. It works with the same mighty strength He used when He walked in the Messiah to raise Him, sorry, yeah, when He worked in the Messiah to raise Him from the dead and seat Him at the right hand in heaven, far above every ruler, Authority, power, dominion, far above. You get it? Who mm -hmm. stands higher than the mission? 27 foot tall statue. Decreed in heaven, Caesar is God. Since Julius wrote the comment, says, Oh, please, the one who sits higher than that. As the decreed is the king who is your season. Right? Or any other name that can be named either in the Olam Hazeb or the Olam Haba. In the world now or the world to come, it doesn't matter. Also, he has put all things under his feet and made him the head over everything in the Messianic community or the church, whatever your translation says there which is his body, the full expression of him who falls all creation. Right, let's talk a little bit here. The promised seal of the Ruach HaKodesh. What's the Holy Spirit supposed to do for you? Cancel, help, comfort, teach, change your heart, cause you to walk in toilet. Supposed to bring change. Right? What is the blood of Yeshua supposed to do for you? Marrow? Empty. Atone? Clean? In the mikvah, clean. But yeah. Establishes, brings in the new covenant. What else? Huh? Stops all activity. You are no longer that guy. You will now learn kingdom through the Ruach of Redemption. You will understand your place as one of us 
You will understand that we're a family. You will understand that you will be established in this kingdom. Who decrees that? The one who is in the highest heaven. Yeah? Guys, the blood of Messiah covers you. And I know it's the Kapuha, and it's the guilt offering, and it's the Pesach lamb, and it's all the rest of it. But you need to understand, if you don't die, you can never become renewed. If you don't stop the way you used to live, if you don't stop the way you used to think, you don't stop the way you acted then. The blood of the Lamb is a perfect you. Why? Because, yes, He died for you. The Ruach of Adesh promised, come and change. But if you choose not to yield to it, if you choose not to walk in it, if you choose not to change your conduct, what does it matter? I'm not nullifying your blood, I'm nullifying, I'm nullifying your decision. You're saying, I don't care about the blood of Yeshua. You're saying, I don't care about the Holy Spirit. You're saying, I don't want to change. What you're saying is, all I want to do is be free to be me. What's wrong with that statement? You are not accountable to anything or anybody, and you know the fun thing about that is, when you had your your hands on the steering wheel of your life, all you created was death. How many of you can think of? Let's take up your hand. How many of you can think of at least five decisions that would have probably got you killed? And I'm not just talking about physical. Show me what guarantee you have that God should let you into His kingdom because of all the awesomeness that you have done. I don't, I don't know how to say this, but if I look at my awesomeness, and all, I'm not even exceptional in Benoni. I'm not even exceptional in South Africa. I'm not definitely not exceptional worldwide. I die tomorrow, then what? The world will stop turning because Vince is no longer here. No. Vince who? And yet, the one who created it all is the one who says, You're mine. I've chosen you. I'm going to establish you, I'm going to lift you up, I'm going to put you in my kingdom, and it doesn't matter whether your body gives out or not, the inheritance is coming, I'll guarantee it myself. When it's all said and done, when everything's under his feet. He calls your name. When the world has long forgotten it. If he tells. Are you living in his mouth? Are you giving it your best to learn, to grow, to change? South African culture, never mind Roman culture, worldwide culture will tell you a whole bunch of things about what it is to be normal in this day and age. It's normal to work yourself to death and then expect retirement if you behave yourself and you might have enough. It's normal to send your kids to school and when they come home, you make them do homework, you make them do chores. Well, maybe sometimes you don't. You spend a little bit of time and you chase them off to bed and that's your relationship with them. Maybe you have a better relationship. It's normal to go out and do things on Friday night. <coughs> it's normal to sleep around with a few people before you decide when you get married. If you want to get married, no pressure. And if it doesn't work out, it's normal to leave. It's counter-cultural. God is calling you to stand against your culture. 
doesn't matter where you come from. You're called to stand separate. And He's brought you, He's chosen you, He's promised you, He sent the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. A guarantee that He's coming back to get you. That your inheritance is fixed. Think about that. Show me an inheritance that's fixed. Show me a piece of land that not, cannot be taken away. <coughs> you go sit in the Middle East and you have your phone and you're having a grand old time. When war comes, that's not your phone. That's very simple. The guy with the bigger gun, that's his phone. When Russia comes down, is Israel God? From a worldly perspective, they go, no. From his perspective, it's just like, call me this boy, I'm coming in a minute. Then we can have that conversation face to face. I need you to understand what it cost that you were chosen, that you were given a clan, that you were given an inheritance, that you were given a kingdom. You weren't just chosen in the sense of, oh, don't worry, we'll give you a piece of land and send it home. You're chosen to be sons, heirs to the throne, daughters of the Most High, an eternal kingdom that will never be taken away and never be shaken. Established forever. Rome thought they were strong and they lost forever. They fall. Long time ago. God's kingdom is barely in our sense. It's in the baby stages of what he's going to do. And they call about the birth, the birth pants, right? He hasn't even brought it into its fullness yet. You've seen a little piece of an ultrasound and you're going, yeah, through the prophet. You've seen another little toe stick out and you go, yeah, that's def def definitely coming in. I saw that in Acts. But a picture of an ultrasound is not looking at that baby face to face. It's coming. And you can choose. Be a Roman or be his. But if you choose to be his, be his. Walk accordingly. Act the way a citizen should act. So that he can establish his kingdom and you can be part of it. You getting this? Alright. I'm gonna stop it. Let that sink in. Alright? Any questions or any thoughts? Please stop talking about it. Alright, prayer time is at the time.